Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The hand, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live. And recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall, not, shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 1 through 2, 14 through 24. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there? When they nailed him to the tree. And were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in? The tomb. Lord be with you. This morning's text is from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. 
Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture on this blessed Easter morning. Let us pray together. And now, Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you, our rock and our redeemer, our savior and our friend. We pray in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> well, just imagine with me for a moment that you've been invited to a get-together, a party, at a place you've never been before. And I know right now that sounds like a dream to be able to go and be somewhere, but just, just imagine with me. Now, you don't know the way, you don't know how to get there, no one's really given you a, an address or instructions, but one of your friends who is also invited to this party, they're going and they know the way. So they say to you, you can follow me if you want. And so you get in your car to follow them in theirs. And the entire time, your eyes are fixed on the back of your friend's car. You know their license plate number. You know their make, their model, their trim level. You even notice the little quirky things like the little scratch on the back where they backed into a mailbox one time. You've worried, you've, you've studied the back of this car because you know you've got to follow that car to get where you're going. And so the entire drive, you've got your eyes fixed on your friend's car, hoping that you don't catch a red light, that they squeezed all the yellow out of, that they ran it just before you. Or maybe you're hoping that someone doesn't cut you off, get in front of you, and now block your view of your friend's rear bumper. That entire trip, your, your safe, timely arrival is dependent upon your ability to remain right behind, within eyesight of your friend's car. Now, of course, everything works out. You, you follow them, you arrive at the place, you, you came to party and you had a good time. And then it comes time to leave. And the friend you followed has already gone. But you say to yourself, well, it wasn't that hard to get here after all. I think I remember the way. Except now... Now it's dark, and you arrived in the middle of the afternoon. So after driving now in the dark for a little while, you convince yourself, this feels like I've been driving straight too long. I feel like there's a turn coming up, but nothing looks familiar. You remember on the way there, you saw a little pink house with green shutters, but now you can't see it. It's too dark. It, it's too far back from the road. Or, or maybe as you're driving, you didn't notice that jacks on the way down, but maybe you weren't paying attention. And where? You start thinking to yourself, where are all the street lights in this town? I found myself doing that one evening, driving down a familiar road in this community in my car and realizing, I'm not sure I can get out of a driveway. It's so dark. 
And then for there, there are those of us who, who have watched one too many crime drama television shows, listened to too many true crime podcasts, and in a night when we don't know where we're going, don't know how to get there, our minds start to wonder, what if I get a flat and my cell phone doesn't work? And some crazy person in an old panel van shows up. Your mind starts to race in the dark as you drive around, missing a turn, another turn not looking so familiar. You might be a little lost. In the night, the dark, it just adds a little to your anxiety because you know you can miss things in the dark. Or let's be, let's be a little less dangerous, a little less dramatic. And let's just say you wake up one morning at 2 o'clock, which is maybe easy to do these days as our sleep rhythms may be off, as some of us are working for a week at a time and then not a week, or as we're staying at home trying to homeschool our kids or work from home, and all of a sudden night is day and day is night. We're not really sure what we're doing. But maybe you wake up at 2 a.m., you can't go back to sleep, and there's nothing good to watch on either Netflix or on your television. And so you decide you need a glass of water or a glass of milk, maybe a peanut butter sandwich or something. But you don't want to wake up your spouse. You don't want to wake up the kids. And so you, you ease out of the bed, and you begin this long, dark journey to the kitchen. You tiptoe down the hall, uh, hoping you don't step on the dog toy, in the, in the hallway, or that one Lego you know your son left somewhere, and you know if you step on that one Lego with your bare feet, you're going to say something to wake everybody up. So you start leaning forward, moving with your feet slowly. You start sort of flinging your fingers out in front of you, feeling in the dark for the edge of the coffee table before your shin finds it. You run your hand down the wall, down the counter, down the cabinets, counting the knobs, hoping you got the right cabinet for the right glass or plate or whatever it is you want. And then you, you say a brief prayer, hoping as you reach in that you don't pull anything else out that might shatter on the floor. And finally, you reach for the, the faucet or maybe the refrigerator door to get what you need before making your long, blind, groping trip back to the bedroom. But if it were daylight... If it were daylight or if you could turn all the lights on, well, it wouldn't be a problem at all. It'd be so undramatic, it'd be, it'd be not noteworthy at all. To just get up from where you were, walk effortlessly into the kitchen. You'd stroll right through the house without a second thought. But in the dark, in the dark, everything seems different. You could have slept in that room for a, a hundred nights, slept through a thousand thunderstorms, but in the dark... Something's different. In the dark, you might miss things. Because things are different in the dark. At least they feel different in the dark. Things seem more dangerous in the dark. Life seems to require more cautious, cautious pace in the darkness. We take the light of day for granted sometimes, for even when the clouds hang thick above us, the power, the light from the sun is so strong that it breaks through and illuminates our lives. Yet, yet in the dark, in the dark, in the dark of night, even the brightest full moon is little more than a pale reflection of the sun's glory. The shadows still seem mysterious. Things move and we can't quite figure out what they are. The dark was well, scary. I remember as a kid being told to come inside before it gets dark. We flip switches, we burn fires to keep the dark out. We tell each other, well, you can go over there, but don't go over there at night because it's dark. That's why it seems strange to me that John's gospel, the fourth gospel, tells us the story of the first Easter morning, not, not in the first rays of the sun rising over the horizon, but while it was still dark. Matthew's gospel doesn't tell it that way. 
Matthew's gospel tells of Jesus' resurrection taking place at the first day of the week was dawning, as the first day of the week was dawning. One gets the sense that it's almost set to, to music, a composition that as Christ rose from the grave, the sun rose over the horizon. But Mark, Mark, uh, he, his gospel is way more straight to the point. Mark tells it in a more matter-of-fact sort of way. Mark's gospel is always just sort of getting to the point, using language cheaply, not overusing words, no frills to the way Mark tells stories. So when Mark tells the events of Jesus' resurrection, he says it took place very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen. The sun is up. In Mark's gospel, bathing the scene with that orangey glow of the first few hours of the early morning. And then there's Luke's gospel. Luke tells us everything took place at early dawn, that time of morning when the air is still crisp, when the light is still soft, when the ground is still damp with dew. But John's gospel... John's gospel leaves no doubt. John doesn't tell us uh, an ambiguous time of dawn. John doesn't tell us uh, the hour. John doesn't tell us anything chronological. Rather, John tells us it was still dark. If it were in those final, final moments of night before the initial flicker of the dawn's rays wrapped around the horizon then it was surely not just dark, but the darkest time of night. John's Gospel says it was still dark when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Mary Magdalene is so overcome in this story, so overcome with anxiety, that she cannot wait for the, the first light of day to, to run to the grave of her beloved friend to grieve. She can't wait for the sun to come up at the right time when the Sabbath was over. She couldn't wait. She had to go while it was dark. But when she arrives, when, when she's close enough to see the tomb, to see the outline against the black curtain of the sky, she notices that the stone has been removed. Now, for those of us who know the story, those of us who sing songs about the joy of stones being rolled away, who shout praises at such news, we forget that, that Mary doesn't know. She doesn't know this story. She's in the middle of it happening. And so we can understand that she's, she's afraid. She's afraid that in this moment, somebody has taken her Lord's body that perhaps grave robbers have come in the cover of darkness to take it, to, 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 to malign it, to, to use it as, a, as an excuse against his disciples. So in a panic, she runs to Peter. She runs to Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loves, who is never no named in this gospel, but simply referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. She runs to those two and she tells them they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. She thinks the worst. Because all she could do in the darkness is see that the stone had been removed. She didn't go inside. She didn't light a lamp. She didn't bring a, a flashlight. She didn't have any of those things. She went to the tomb and saw all she could see in the dark that the stone was rolled away. And after hearing her report, Peter and the other disciple run to the tomb. Now, I love, I love the way the fourth gospel tells this story. John's gospel is often attributed to the so-called beloved disciple who is traditionally understood as John, one of the twelve. But those of you who've had me in Bible study know that, that I, I tend to think it's Lazarus, but that, that's a, a discussion for another time. So, of course, when, when Peter and this disciple run to the tomb, we're told three times that the other disciple, for this sake we'll call John, beat Peter to the tomb. He outruns Peter in verse 4. Peter followed him in verse 6. And in verse 8, we're told again that the disciple whom he loved reached the tomb first. 
It's a little bit of a contest in the gospel. But regardless of who got there first, what the two disciples found when they got there was disheartening, to say the least. They found the linen wrappings lying there, the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. No Jesus, no body, just cloth. The body of Jesus was gone. They came looking for a corpse, but instead they just found the grave clothes. We're told that the other disciple, again the one whom Jesus loved, saw and believed, but it's telling to me that both of the disciples returned to their homes. You get the feeling that they ran to the tomb expecting to find something, expecting to find his body, expecting to find signs of, of robbers or foul play. But when they didn't find it, they went back home. Assuming the wild ride they had been on with Jesus all these years was now really over. His body had been stolen as sort of a last slap in the face of the movement and Jesus had started. But did you notice Mary? Mary didn't go home. She had come to the tomb at night expecting to see it intact. And now Jesus' body was gone, apparently stolen. And so what does she do? She doesn't go home to sulk. She doesn't go home to get angry. She doesn't go home like the other disciples to plot what's next. The fourth gospel says, she stood weeping outside the tomb. She hadn't even looked inside the tomb herself yet. But when she did, she saw something the other disciples didn't. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. She saw two angels. The other guy's got cloth. She got angels. Now, did these angels appear only for her, or, or had the disciples simply overlooked them, just coming into the tomb expecting to find one thing, and when they didn't find it, they overlooked everything else? Had they been so focused on what they were expecting to see that in the still dark hours of the early morning, they had missed two angels? And keep in mind, we've, we're the ones who put them in wings and halos and, and an aura around them. But still, they missed two men, two, two messengers sitting right where the body of Jesus had been. I, I don't suppose it's that crazy to think after all, uh, how many of us have looked right past something, looked right over something, because we were so caught up in what we were doing, caught up in looking for something else, that we missed what was right in front of us? Of course, it's the gospel that tells us they're angels. Mary doesn't seem to recognize them as such. She just sees them as, well, two men. When they ask why she's been crying, she tells them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. You see, for Mary, it's still all about the corpse. It's still about figuring out who took Jesus' body and what they did with it. In this early, dark hour of the morning, she is so consumed by her mission to find Jesus' body and its thieves that she hardly takes notice of these angels. Then again, she doesn't seem to notice the partner to these two angels. The gospel says when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. She didn't know. She didn't know. How could she not know? She had been with him for a while. She was one of the only ones, especially in this gospel, who had been there at the crucifixion to see his face, his body, as he hung on the cross. How could she not know? Was the light still too dim to see? Did he, did he hide his face? Did he look different? Was he uh, transfigured again? Was his resurrected body different? All we know 
is that when Jesus asked her the same question the angels asked, when he asked for whom she was looking, Mary thinks Jesus may have actually been the robber who carried away his body. Sir, she says, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll come get him. I'll take him away. Still focused on the thing she came to do. Still focused on the body of Jesus. In her mind, the dead body of the Lord. One gets the feeling she's a little manic. Her hands shaking, her eyes darting back and forth. Her feet unable to sit still as she's overcome by her need to just find Jesus' body. The assumption and expectation that someone has stolen it That she can't recognize the presence of angels or the identity of the one standing in front of her. That she's overcome. She's too focused until until he speaks her name. Mary. A couple of years before my grandmother died, her mind started to fade. She, she'd tell us, we'd be sitting in the living room and she'd lean forward in her chair and she'd say something like, Christopher, look over there, look at them, look, look, look on the table in there, there's a cat smoking cigarettes. She, she'd make claims that strange people were coming into her house to take her food. She'd forget where she was. She couldn't remember things. She called people by the wrong names. My dad's name is Paul, but she started calling him Hubert, which was my granddad's name. My cousin Brad, she started calling by his brother's name, David, and for a while there I got her to start calling him Jim Bob, and that actually stuck, which is another story. But David, my other cousin, Brad's brother David, she started calling Jason Paul, which was my other cousin from my other aunt. She'd get my sister and my stepsister mixed up, and then she'd just flat out forget some of our kinfolk's names altogether. But she never forgot my name. My entire life, I've been called Chris. My entire adult life, I've been called Chris. But to most of my family, I'm still Christopher. And to Grandma, I was Christopher, as you've heard me say before. But right up to the end, Grandma always remembered my name. And that's always stuck with me. I can only imagine, I can only imagine what might go through my head and my heart if I heard her voice say it again. To say, Christopher? I imagine it would be something like what Mary felt when she heard the voice of Jesus say, Mary? Immediately in the gospel, Mary stops her panic search for Jesus' corpse and those who may have taken it. She's jarred back to the reality by Jesus' voice, by the sound of her name on his lips, and she calls him Rabboni, teacher. And we're told he, she tries to touch him, but Jesus says to her, now, now, now don't hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. I've always thought it was a bit odd for Jesus to say to her, do not hold on to me. I mean, think about it right now. How odd is it? to to see someone out, if you have to run to the grocery store, to the gas station, if you're, you're bringing something to a friend's house, how odd is it to have to tell yourself, don't touch them. You can't hug them. You can't shake their hand. Don't touch them. Not even an elbow bump anymore. Don't touch them. It's odd. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me. Don't touch me. Was Mary trying to grab him? trying to to hug him tight in the hopes that she could somehow keep him, keep him to herself so he couldn't leave her again. Mary's not practicing good social distancing here. She wants to touch him, to hold him, to hold on to something. This may be your learning as I am in these weeks. To touch something, to hold on to something, means you can control it. You can manipulate it. 
Maybe, maybe Jesus wanted to make it clear to Mary that the work wasn't over. That you can't hold on to this and, and keep it. And, and you can't hold on to me and just keep it for yourself. We can't hold on to Christ and just keep it for ourselves. And there's still more to be done. Either way, uh, he tells her to go to the other disciples and tell them about his ascension. And so she runs back and announces to the disciples, Peter and the beloved disciple included, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. She had seen the Lord. After Peter and the other disciple saw nothing but grave clothes. Peter, the rock on which Christ will build the church, the beloved disciple, the one whose name is attached to the very gospel, they saw nothing but clothes. After Mary, Mary herself overlooked the angel's presence in the tomb. After Mary mistook Jesus for the gardener. And after, only after Jesus called her by name, did Mary see the Lord. She sees the Lord only after her assumptions and expectations are shattered by the mere mention of her name. She sees the Lord after she is reminded that he knows her name. That she is known by him. And isn't that when we truly see the Lord? When we let go of our expectations and assumptions of what the Lord should look like, of what the Lord should sound like, when we realize that the Lord knows us by name. That's when I've seen the Lord. And like Mary, I've come to testify, even on this unprecedented Easter morning, that I've seen the Lord, not in the false piety of legalism, but in the presence of those gathered in a living room of a friend to share communion. I've seen the Lord not in the self-righteous pronunciations of fundamentalism, but in the liberal acts of love by those who take the commands of Christ seriously. I've seen the Lord not in the ritual acts of overstressed religion, but even in, in our youth and our children as they joyfully serve others in nursing homes, taking them cards and, and, and drawing them pictures and just being there. I've seen the Lord not in the divisive practices of those who expect Him to look, sound, and talk like them, but in the eyes of Haitian children as they walk holding hands with American adults down dusty roads in Port-au-Prince. I've seen the Lord, but not in the ways I've ever expected or assumed but in the ways that friends gather together in the kitchen of one who just lost a loved one to share a prayer, hugs, a casserole dish, and to say, I'm here if you need me and mean it. Friends, I've seen the Lord. And even in these intervening weeks, even as we've come up to this morning, I've seen the Lord in ways that in spite of this pandemic, in spite of social distancing, I've seen the Lord in the ways that the body of Christ has come together to still find ways to provide food for hungry families. The way families come together to support local businesses hoping to stay open. How people are finding creative and unique ways to pray together, to worship together, to stay connected as friends and sisters and brothers in Christ. I've seen the Lord. And it's almost always in the most unexpected ways. And it's always, always once I realize that the Lord already sees me. That Christ already knows me. That Jesus already knows my name. So yes, even on this most unusual Easter morning, friends, I've seen the Lord. I wonder, I wonder what you've seen. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, as we come together in worship in different ways. 
We pray on this Easter Sunday that we are made all the more mindful of your resurrection. How it shatters our expectations, disrupts our very lives in ways we cannot comprehend. But help us, God, to be mindful. As much as we expect to see you, as we see you in unexpected ways, that you always and forever see us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.